Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Our topic is holiday entertaining, stock, sauces, and gravies, hosted by Lumina Financial Strategies. Your moderator and speaker today is Allison Fleming. With that, I'd like to introduce you to our guest speaker for our topic today, holiday entertaining with stock, sauces, and gravies. So Chris, uh, Chris Scott, there he is. Hi there. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, who, a gentleman who has become a good friend of ours. We met early on in the pandemic when I was looking for someone who knew how to do makeup for this old face with the white hair and the fair skin because I was challenged. Uh, well, I met Chris in that uh, time frame because I found him online and he's since been helping us prep for all of our webinars every two weeks. He joins us behind the scenes and he helps with the lighting. He helps with the staging. He helps with all of the things that go on behind the scenes and has is also multi, multi talented. As we've gotten to know him better, he has a number of businesses. One of them is fine tune your zoom, which is about getting your environment ready to appear great on camera. And he also is a professional makeup artist in San Francisco. And he also has a catering company called Running Fork and uh, just a multifaceted creative individual. So um, he offered to do our holiday entertaining um, webinar this week, this uh, week again. Last year he did one with the spicy noni cocktails and the crab stack. So this year he's got other things up his sleeve. And uh, with that, I would just love to turn it over to you, Chris. Go ahead and take it away and have some fun. All right. Well, hello and welcome. Happy holidays. 10 days till Christmas for those of you who anticipate that uh, glorious uh, holiday. I know I do. Yeah. So la last year we did a fabulous um, webinar, really just about my experience uh, uh, of having a, a, a really high end holiday meal. This year will be our, our 26th annual holiday meal. Um, and uh, for that, we're very excited, uh, meaning what we do at home. Um, hold on, I heard something sizzling on the stove. Nope, everything's okay. Um, so, uh, and so, this, so I decided to drill down a little bit with this uh, particular um, webinar and just talk about you know, some of the elements of cooking that, that elevate your meal. And so that's why I'm calling it stocks, sauces, and gravies. And you will realize why I'm calling it that as we continue. Um, all right, so I love to start with a tip. Um, this is what I've discovered. Someone told me this, and I think I, I already knew it like inherently, but it's good to actually say it. If you're hosting, even if it's casual, make the first thing people put in their mouth really good. I'm not saying make the other things bad, but I'm saying make them want more. It heightens the experience. If the first thing they taste is, oh, that's, that's all right. Then they're the you know the level goes down, but by boosting it, uh, so so focus on that first thing they get in their mouth and the set, and then the last thing they have, um, because that's what they remember uh, when they leave. Like oh, they have that lingering flavor of whatever it was. So that's my tip number one. So uh, speaking of something special, we're gonna do something special. Uh, this is called the pom pom. Now this cocktail is outstanding. And I'm gonna demonstrate it to you today on, uh, on how to actually make the cocktail. Um, so let me come over to my cocktail area. And uh, before you take that slide down, let me just say that um, the, the, uh, the recipe is there. So, and you all are gonna get all these slides. So don't feel like you have to follow along. I'm just gonna um, demo it for you. Okay, so let, let me show you how to do this. Hi, so pom pom. Basically, it's a citrus cocktail. What's a citrus cocktail? It's classic. It's generally speaking, they say it's two parts spirits, meaning alcohol, one part citrus, and then half part sweet. And that's that great balance. So your margarita is that drink, your gin gimlet, your vodka gimlet, not your martini, but I love a citrus cocktail. So that's what I'm gonna feature today. Um, the other thing, hold on, my butter is burning. <laughs> Okay, good. We're fine now. Gotta See, love the live, live demonstrations. That's it. <laughs> um, it didn't really burn. It just, you know, made that little funny noise. So anyway, um, I love simple syrup. I make my own simple syrup. Uh, it's basically equal parts water, sugar, 
boil it for a couple minutes, you got syrup. Great sweetener. What is grenadine? Well, grenadine is made from uh, pomegranate, pomegranate juice. But generally speaking, when you buy uh, grenadine at the store, it's gross. It's got the red, you know, red food coloring. It's too sweet, not enough pomegranate. What the heck? So instead, I said, hey, I'll make my own gosh darn grenadine. Um, and that's because I went shopping and I was like, no, here's a $20 bottle of, you know, grenadine. This will be good. And it was great, but it was 20 bucks. And I thought, I can do better than that. And I can. So I'm going to share that with you. The star of the show is, of course, pomegranate juice. So just go out and get a pomegranate juice. And then equal parts of the liquid to sugar, same thing. Boil it. Boil it for a couple minutes. Let it just barely slightly thicken, okay? And then take it off the heat, let it cool, put it in the fridge. It was going to last a long time. So um, what's great about this drink is it's versatile. It doesn't matter what your spirit of preference is, or if no spirit is a preference, it's still a great um, addition to a mocktail. So today I'm showing you gin, uh, gold rum, which really is the cocktail that I discovered this in. It's called the it's called a Bacardi cocktail. Um, uses gold rum. It's really good. Uh, vodka and tequila, because tequila is my favorite. Um, but today I'm going to use vodka, and I'll tell you why. Part of uh, making things taste good is making them look good. If something looks really appetizing, you anticipate it more. It just heightens the senses, right? So um, when I use um, a, a gold-based uh, beverage, like you can see this rum here has a lot of gold in it, um, it, it makes a nice amber color, and it's still pretty, don't get me wrong, but for Christmas, it's nice to have a nice clear one. Oh, you might be wondering who my friend is. Um, this drink is the one that I celebrated with my crew, Crew de Gave. We run from Big Chief down to Baby Gator, the newest member of our team, and so I just want to do a shout out to Crew de Gave. Um, the agave, of course, is tequila, the cactus that makes tequila because that is our, our choice of preference. So let's make the drink, <laughs> enough about me. All right, so today I'm gonna do a four, two, one. The ratio is always the same. You know, the first one is, is whatever, the, the next one is half, and the next one is half of that. So I'm gonna be using Sky Vodka because everybody loves Sky Vodka. So I'm gonna do four ounces. This is actually a three ounce measuring cup. So, and I have a dribble pour, so yeah, it's slow. So that's three ounces. I'm gonna do one more ounce. So I'm gonna show you how easy this is. That's right, four ounces, just like that. Now I'm gonna do two ounces of lime juice, but hey, let's talk limes, shall we? I don't know about you, but recently uh, limes, you get them, sometimes they're great, sometimes they're bitter, sometimes they're dry. And I'm a real purist. And so Big Chief of our crew said to me, why don't you just buy the bottle of lime juice? And I was like, get out of my face. But I discovered this, organic lime juice. And what's beautiful about this is that it is um, consistent. What that means is every time I use it, it tastes the same. So my recipes are very consistent. So we're gonna put this in our, in our drink today. It's brand new, so let me shake it up a little bit. So I did four parts of, of the vodka, so how many parts of this should I do? Anyone, anyone? That's right, two ounces, because it's four, two, one. So I'm gonna do two ounces of the citrus, simple, simple, and then one part of pom pom. This is my, this is my homemade grenadine but I like to call it pong because, you know, when people hear grenadine, they get freaked out. One part pong. And we'll pour that in here. And this is really, really simple. In, in, in the wintertime, I like um, cocktails on the stem. I like them up without ice because um, I just think they're prettier. So here's my shaker glass. Ice is your friend. Whenever you're making cocktails, if ever, you say to yourself, should I add more ice? That means you should. So I'm gonna fill this up with ice. I'm gonna put the top on, make sure it's nice and secure. I like to cover with a towel because this gets kind of cold. 
Now, shout out to my sister, Amy. So this is my, so when I do a cocktail, I like to roll the ice from the front to the back of the shaker. This is me, this is what I like. Here's my sister. She likes to just beat the ice up. And both, both ways work, I'm down. But whatever, make sure you shake it really well. See how the towel sticks to the, um, the shaker, that means it's really cold. Now you're ready. I've chilled my stem glass. There's ice in there, right, and water. I'm gonna just toss that. Sorry, cat. No, there's no cat there. And then pour it in. Now, if you wanna make it pretty, you can throw a, you know, cranberry in here or something, but I don't like things in my drink that I have to strain with my teeth. Isn't that a beautiful color? Nice and frosty looking, but what's, you know, where's the truth? Mm. I love it. That palm, that pomegranate syrup makes this drink sore. Yum, yum. But hey, not everybody drinks alcohol. So let's make one without alcohol. It's really simple. I can measure it, but I'm not going to. Put a little bit of palm syrup in the bottom, not a little bit more, in the bottom of your glass. You notice this glass is full of ice. Oh, wait, it looks like, I wonder if it needs more ice. Get more ice. Now, pick, um, with this, I like either a lemon or a lime soda. Doesn't matter. This one's still on my hand, so I'll use it. Lemon sparkling water, right? Throw that in there. But I like to give this drink a little punch. So what I mean by that is I'm still going to add just a little bit of lime juice, just like that. And then I'm gonna stir it up, because obviously that doesn't look right. So I'm gonna stir all that together. Yeah, you don't wanna shake this with the carbonated water because you'll have a bomb on your hands. Can you see how the color comes up? Absolutely 100% alcohol free. And what's great about this is, you know, everybody can share and share alike. Cheers. Mm. Oh my God, that's so good. And cheers. So good. Also, if you are a spirit drinker, but you're like, I would like to have a couple and not like fall asleep before the soup. You can put a little bit of your sparkler in it. Gives it some effervescence and it lightens it up. That is my pom pom. Uh, so if you have any questions about the drink, now's the time to raise your hand. So we'll just wait until uh, we'll see if anybody wants to ask a question. If not, we'll move on. Any hands there? No, nope. does not look like we have any hands right now. I was very thorough, wasn't I? You were very thorough right there. Thank you. That's what I do. I'm thorough. So let's move on. Tip number two. So for those of you who are on the webinar today that are coming over here for Christmas Eve, you know that right now I, I'm a liar. Uh, but what I love is um, sending invitations through the mail. Um, even if people go, oh, we always go over there Christmas Eve or Christmas Day or whatever. When they get invitation, they, they go, oh, are you doing something different this year? Should I be, you know, should I be interested in, in seeing that? And, um, and the truth is they should be interested in, in attending your, um, your event. So my tip number two is... Send out invitations, it heightens. We ordered ours a long time ago this year. They never showed up, you know, and I don't blame anybody for stuff not showing up in the mail anymore. So we just sent out emails, so yes, but we did do a nice little display. So anyway, tip number two, invite them formally. They, it'll make them dress better and feel more excited about the event. All right, what's next? Okay, so let's get to the meat and potatoes of this, this um, webinar. Why stocks, sauces, and gravies, okay? And we'll tell you why. Next slide, please. 
So, like, even look at this plate. You have this gorgeous filet sitting there, but then there's yummy, like, looks like a mushroom, maybe a port reduction stock all over it. It, it beyond that, the combination of that stock um, being, being in that sauce, um, uh, you know, the, with, with, with the meat, it, that's going to taste so good. It just looks really appealing. So I love adding a, a little bit of sauce. You know, I, the only reason I eat Mexican food is so I can eat salsa. I know that's not true, but I don't know if I'd eat it as much if there wasn't salsa. So, uh, and, and the whole thing about creating awesome, yummy, um, concentrated flavors is it's a process. It's easy, but it's, it's a process. And, uh, and the stocks that you make are the basis for soups, for sauces and reductions and gravies. So just remember the better the stock, the better the flavor. And we'll talk about stock in a minute. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, stock, let's talk about it now. So this is called, uh, stock 101. There are lots of different kinds of stock. We all know that. You can make stock from your vegetables, from your poultry, from your, um, from your beef, from your fish. Lots of different kinds of stock. I'm going to share with you, uh, this is the stock that I made this year for Thanksgiving. I like a real hearty stock flavor when I make my gravy for Thanksgiving. So here's how I do it. I, um, I go get, I buy like hey, Chris, a we chicken. Can't see your, Chris, we can't see your camera. There, we can right. see your camera. Okay. There you are. Okay, good. You, oh, you want to see me too? Ah, uh, yes, indeed. Oh, thank you. Okay, it's me. Um, I went out and bought uh, turkey wings and uh, turkey necks and stuff, tossed them with a little oil, salt and pepper, threw them in the oven at 450, right? Cook them, cook them, cook them. Turn the fan on. You want to get them smoky. And then right when they're almost, and turn them a few times, and then turn on the broiler and caramelize them. So you can see where, we, where parts of uh, this meat has caught. Um, it's a little bit dark. That's where the caramel flavor is. So that's how I start my stock. And pretty much that's all I add, except one other thing, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> So I take all my uh, bones and I throw, this is a huge stock pot that I have, huge. And that little weird kind of UFO saucer disc you see in that picture, that's actually some stock I had frozen that I just didn't, I thought, oh, let me use it. So I threw it in the pot as well. So that, that's what that is. And now understand that stock takes all day. In fact, it takes two days, um, but you don't have to stand there all day. It does it all on its own. So just know that, this is a um, this is a process. All right. Next slide, please. And now that my slide is on, you'll notice that I'm still sipping the adult beverage. After you take those nice caramelized pieces out of your roasting pan, you look at your roasting pan on the left. And you go, ah, oh, now I have to clean that. Well, yeah, you do. But you know what? There's a Japanese word, which I don't know, uh, but basically means don't waste flavor. And so you definitely don't want to waste that flavor because that's like, that's the debris. That's the concentrated form of flavor. So you throw your roasting pan on the stovetop, turn on the heat pretty high, and you can add whatever liquid you want to the pan. You can add wine, water, um, broth, if you want, well, you know, but something and get it to boil and with a, with a wooden spoon, you're going to scrape off that pan. And so it's going to, well, it's going to clean the pan. I mean, at least get all that, you know, baked on stuff off, which is great. But more importantly, you, you've captured all that amazing flavor. Then you're going to take that liquid, pour it into the stock pot as well. So you can see where the flavors are already condensing. Next slide, please. I get excited with stock, if anybody knows me. Um, so add water, makes its own sauce. There's nothing to stock once you're this far. Fill that pot up with water, right? And then turn it, get it to a boil, um, but you don't want it to be at a rapid boil. And we'll talk about that, but you just want to get it to a boil to bring it down. Um, the one addition that I'd like to add to this particular stock is a handful of porcini mushrooms. So on the right, that's what you see in the upper part of the picture. That those are dried porcini mushrooms, and they're great. 
because if you ever work with porcinis, you know, you're supposed to, if you buy them dry, you reconstitute them in water and you get that nice brown uh, water that you may reincorporate or not. Anyway, um, those porcinis, all that beautiful, yummy brown flavor is going right into your stock. Um, so it just makes it a little bit richer, a little je ne sais quoi. So next slide, please. Now we're going to start the reduction. So take a look at this. You, you see the amount of bubbles that are going on there? Those are the amount of bubbles you want, okay? You're not rapidly boiling it, but what you are doing is you're letting those little small bubbles work. When I make stock, I, I basically my rule is three. I fill up the pot. I, I take it down to about a third. I fill it back up with water. I take it back down to a third, about a third down, um, meaning there's, so there's still two thirds left in the pot. Then I add more water. And then the third time, this is why it takes all, all day, right? But what happens is all those bones that are in there that have all those little ingredients and marrows and things, they get slowly broken down. They get, they fall apart. So you end up getting like, all, you extract all the flavor from those bones. Um, so you don't really, it's not really labor intensive when you do this. Um, it's just there all day, right? Um, great. Now, what do you, so, so when you're done with that, you have to, um, you let it cool at the end of the day and you're going to strain it because you just want the liquid. So strain out all the bones, all the porcini mushrooms, all the little bits, and, uh, and then strain it again through a really fine sieve. Try to make it as, as clean as possible. Wait till it's cooled down. Stick it in the fridge overnight. And then next morning, here's what you're going to do. You're going to do it all over again. Um, no, no questions yet, please. So what we're going to do, so the next, no questions yet. Um, so now we're... <laughs> So, could we go back to the last I'm slide? I'm so sorry. I'm having some issues. Technical should we, difficulties. Should we be concerned? There we go. Sorry we need to that. call help. Okay. Um, evaporate and concentrate. So when we did the stock, it's called a re you're reducing. You're taking a lot of a lot of liquid and you're reducing it down. But and then the next morning you have all this yummy stuff. So this is actually a smaller pot. That's why it looks full. Um, put it back on the stove, but now we're going to evaporate it. I don't know, can you still see it behind me? Uh, back on my stove, I have um, stock evaporating as we speak. What that means is you want to bring it up to a boil, but then you want to lower it. Oh yeah, take a look at that. Um, if you can get one, one moment where it gets past the steam, the liquid is actually rolling underneath the surface but there's no bubbles breaking the surface. That's what you want. Two to four hours max for this, all right? It, but it, it reconcentrates the flavor. I know, it seems like a lot of work, but man, the, you, then you got heaven. You got that stock that lives forever. Then you take it off the stove, strain it again. Uh, let it cool, put it in the fridge, and now you're ready when you're gonna make your gravies, your sauces, your what have yous. I was wondering, any questions? Anybody think, what, what the heck was that all uh, about? Any comments? I Mr. actually have a question. Yes, please, question. So bone broth, is this the same stuff as bone broth? Because I have some very dear friends that swear by bone broth all the time. They swear that, that it just, heals everything is well, this the same stuff as bone broth or is this yeah, a different yeah. stuff no I, I i think i think you're right yeah because bones have the marrow bones have that the healing properties if you will if you will um when you go to buy like broth at the store there's chicken broth there's stock uh there's bone broth right and uh so if, if you think about it broth is like um consomme it's like uh you just want a light little you know, uh, broth because you have a cold or whatever. Stock is a little more hearty. Maybe it's made with vegetables mm -hmm. and meat or just vegetables that are boiled down. But bone broth is really that this process of, uh, and of course you see there's meat on those bones too. Um, this is, bone broth is really good uh, with beef. Like if you're making uh, pho, the Vietnamese soup, 
um, you get those, the shanks of the, um, of, of the cow and the marrow that's all in the, oh my God. And you really cook that stuff down. So there is a difference, broth, stock, and mm -hmm. bone broth, definitely. Thank you. I wondered about mm -hmm. that. Um, yeah. Anything Anybody else? I have a question. I see no more questions. Man, I am, I am so good. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We do have a question. All we right. have a question. Uh, Jerry, you have a question. Um, we see you there. And so Caress can um, let you un unmute your mic and then go ahead and ask your question. All right, you're good to go, Jerry. Maybe. Jerry. Hand is up. Mic is open. Caress, can you help him? Prompt him to unmute. Oh, Jerry's hand is down. Maybe his mic isn't working. Yeah, some, you know, it's that stupid, which mic is um, is my computer using yes. thing on Zoom? Yeah. Hate it. Yeah. Okay. So um, okay. now we do have another question, though. Uh, Carolyn has a question. So uh, okay. I don't know, Carolyn, if it's you or Ed there, uh, but go ahead and ask your question. Uh, do I, do, can you hear us? Yes, yes, I can hear you. I'm, I'm wondering about the concentration for something like um, stock or broth, because I always save the juices when I smoke a turkey or whatever, and, and I reduce the, all of the, the bones and things. But I have a hunch it's stronger than what you can buy in the store. And I'm just wondering about the, how, how diluted or strong it should be. For uh, when you make it yourself or when you buy it? Uh, if I wanted to do something equivalent to what's in the store, what would be the concentration? I guess it's well, like what, how much uh, water is in beer versus right, right, right. Alcohol. The the trick is to look at the color of it, um, because it the more you reduce it, the 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 more concentrated, the more opaque the color becomes. So if you'd like to be be able to almost see through your broth, then you don't you don't reduce it that long. Um, if you wanted your uh, broth to be, your, your stock to be richer, then you take it down deeper. Like for gravies, I like a real rich stock uh, because I want the gravy to have a real full flavor. Is, am I answering the question? Uh, yes, so you can hear it, me. It's, it's usually in the color more than anything else. No, no I think we're good All right. to move, move What's forward. next? I'm so, I'm so excited about what's next. <laughs> Oh, really? Okay, so I'm gonna feature a hollandaise sauce today. Now there's of course tons of sauces. I love port reductions, wine reductions. Uh, I love triple reductions, which I won't get into, but um, hollandaise sauce is like, it, it, they call it the mother sauce because there's so many other sauces that you, you start with the same concept as hollandaise sauce, but then you, um, and then you add things to it, um, but but here but here's the deal uh, with holiday sauce. You know you're standing at a stovetop and you have to whisk these eggs with water and you can't let them get burned or whatever. And it takes a lot of time. So today, rather than making you watch all that because we don't have enough time, I'm going to show you a fast method and no one's going to know the difference because it's going to taste so good. Up. Except your French saucier. Um, so um, so there you go. That's, yeah, that's me, there you um, are. but I'm going here. I'm going here. So we're going over here. Are you guys ready? We're ready. All right, let's do it. Let's do a hollandaise sauce. I'm ready. I'm, so, hi, welcome back to Chris's Kitchen. So here we go with, um, with the sauce. So this is a blender hollandaise. Um, I actually, there's recipes everywhere. I'm using the one from Antoine's restaurant, the oldest restaurant in San Francisco and New Orleans. Thank you very much. Um, it's really simple, a hollandaise sauce, but what, besides the fact that it tastes good, and most of us have had a Ace Benedict say in the hollandaise sauce, we love it, tastes great, right? Um, but why do you wanna serve it beyond that? Well, imagine this, Joe, so you're serving a meal. Let's talk about heightening the appet appetizing factor. 
and you've done a nice sea, nice fish or something, and you've put asparagus next to it. It looks really pretty. And you serve it and you go, ooh, fish and asparagus, so pretty. But instead, on the asparagus, you drizzle this little loop of hollandaise sauce up it. So that bright yellow contrasts the deep green of the asparagus. And you set it down and someone goes, ooh, what's this? I'm excited to taste that, as they should be. So beyond it being um, adding an element to the vegetable, it also adds a visual element. And I know that all might seem stupid to you, like who cares? But we're funny people, us humans. And, you know, we're, we're very, um, what's the word? We're, we're in our head a lot. And what titillates our brain tits, titillates our, our mouth. So titillate the brain, the eye function with what people see. Um, uh, yeah, I was about to tell you a quick, stupid story, but I'm not. All right, let's go on. Oh, this drink is for my friend, so I'm going to keep it till it comes over till Christmas Eve. But I'm going to sit from it. This is the uh, non-alcohol. Blender hollandaise. I'm making a small batch today. So what I've done is I have put two um, egg yolks in there. Gross. So those are just egg yolks, raw. Um, I really love the traditional recipe, not the one that I, I shared with you. The traditional recipe just uses cayenne pepper. And we all know cayenne, ground cayenne pepper is super duper hot. So I tend to use a measuring spoon. I, I almost never measure stuff, um, but I have to be careful. I'm not really measuring. It's just because if I go like this and go tap, 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 and a big clump falls out, nah, game over. So this is a, a eighth of a teaspoon, right? I'm going to put that into the, into the um, egg yolk. But what I like, and I love, I love white pepper. White pepper is, it's milder yet hotter than um, black pepper. So you don't get the pepper flavor so much, but you get the temperature of it. So I'm going to add a little bit of white pepper. And this I'm a little more careful with, so I can do it like this. I'm going to add a little white pepper to my blender. So right now in here, I have um, the, the, two, uh, the, the two peppers and the egg yolk. Now I'm gonna add kosher salt. And I do suggest, uh, unless for some reason you, there's a specific salt you wanna use, use kosher salt. And I'll tell you why. Let me sprinkle a little bit in. That should be good. Um, kosher salt is man-made. So every granule tastes the same. It has the same amount of salt. It's much like the lime juice in the bottle that I shared with you in the cocktail. It's very consistent. So when you use kosher salt, uh, you know exactly the amount of salt you're getting. It sort of helps you gauge because, you know, once you oversalt something, game over. So um, using kosher salt kind of keep, sort of keeps you in check, all right? So I put the, the seasonings and the egg yolk in there. This is gonna be loud, so I'm just gonna do this real quick. Let me move my blender forward. <clears throat> Excuse me. And just mixing that up. Now, the last thing I'm going to add before the butter is lemon. Now, lemon is an acid, and there's raw egg yolk in there. So when you put acid on top of that egg yolk, it's going to start cooking it. It's like ceviche. You cook the fish in the, in the lime juice, right? So you don't want to add this uh, too soon because it'll start to cook it and curdle it and you want your sauce to be smooth and pretty. So now I'm going to add the lemon juice. So I'm going to pour, I don't know, let's say that's a tablespoon. A tablespoon in there, I'm going to mix it up. I have to mix it a lot. Now you see my blender has a little handy take the top off, pour the stuff thing in. If yours doesn't, for the next step, I suggest you can use a plate because we're going to pour butter in. So if you take a little plate and hold it over the top while you pour the butter in, you won't make a mess all over your kitchen because you got to get the butter in there somehow. But for me today, I am going to use my handy dandy little spout and the butter that I spoke of earlier. This is hopefully still okay. I'm going to put it in. So you want this butter warm. Can't even see it, can you? You want this butter warm but not boiling, okay? That's why I had to turn it off. And then I'm gonna take a towel and hold it over this so I don't make a, a big issue. 
I'm gonna hold it just like this. So you drizzle the butter in slowly. And this is the same way you would do it if you were doing it um, stovetop. So I'm gonna turn this on. I'm very slowly adding the butter. Then I stop for a second, let it mix. See how slow I'm going? Boring. Keep going, baby. There. All there. And I just made hollandaise. So let's talk about this hollandaise. Hey, Chris. Yeah. Huh? So that whole time, I think your microphone was correcting the sound and eliminating the blender sound. So that the blender was going that whole time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Your noise canceling was canceling your blender. But you could hear me talk. We could hear you talk. Yes. Well, the, yeah, it's about a minute no. that you're blending. Yeah. So just so, wanted to make sure everybody knew that it was still blending that whole time you were pouring the butter in. We just couldn't hear it blending because of your your microphone. Yeah, and so nice and slow. It's like when you emulsify um, oil in your salad dressing to create, you know, a sauce for your dressing. So I'm going to pour this into a bowl. Can we see? So this is the, yep. Oh, baby. See how smooth that comes out? <sighs> Delicious. So now we have beautiful, ready-to-go hollandaise. Now, the thing about hollandaise is you make it, but, you know, you got other stuff to do. So what can you do to keep this sort of fresh before it's time to serve? But first, I'm going to use a spoon, not my finger, and I'm going to test. Mm, oh, my God. So good. Drizzle that on your broccoli, your asparagus, spinach. It's good on fish. Yum, yum, yum. So a bain-marie is basically a water bath. What I've done is I've heated up some water in a pot and I set, this is the hollandaise, and I set it over there. So the water's not boiling at all. It's just, it's like medium hot. I set it on top. Use, make sure it's a, not a metallic bowl because metallic bowls tend to like to cook things faster. Now it's just going to be fresh. Stir it once or twice. It's going to thicken a little bit. And that's all, that's all there is to it. Hollandaise sauce, ready to go. And it will just elevate the plate. Questions, but uh, just really quickly, and I don't want to run out of time for the rest of your presentation, but um, you did mention that hollandaise sauce is the base for several different sauces. So one of the ones that I think we talked about earlier was Bernays. Because that kind of goes on meat. So did you tell us that you could just add a couple things to hollandaise and it turns it into Bernays? Yeah. So a Bernays sauce, a little bit hardier. The, the herbs you add are tarragon and chervil or chervil. Um, and you add a little um, white vinegar to it. Um, and often people use white vinegar instead of the lemon, a different acid. So you're still doing the same buttery thing the, uh, that you did before uh, with adding the butter to the egg yolk. But instead of using lemon, you use white vinegar and add, then add the herbs at the end. And it's, that's excellent on, um, on beef, on steaks, on medallions, because um, tarragon is a dream uh, herb. And it's also one that I'm going to feature in our, our next section. Okay, moving right along. So Chris asked me to uh, cover tip number three as he is uh, getting himself set up on the other side. Um, and we were talking about presentation as, as we were talking about the invitation, talking about presentation of the actual meal. And we were laughing because uh, we just are recalling times when, you know, especially in my house, we haven't plated the meal and everybody just kind of piles in and 
pushes in front of each other to try to get to the the mashed potatoes first and um there's never enough left for the last guy in the line because the first guy in the line took double amount of meat or whatever needed to be done so plating really 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 helps with the the whole experience of the meal we're talking about that you have to be really organized to plate the meal because uh, one dish at a time coming out you can reuse the dishes chris always recommends that you wash them in between which is a great idea and um then also make use of your warming uh warming trays the warming oven um crock pots uh keeping things hot like he demonstrated on the the hollandaise sauce to keep it uh keep it warm and keep it fresh while you're preparing the other things. So, um, and can I throw in one more thing? Yes, you may. The best thing about table service is, you know, when you have all the food sitting on the table, it's always about, do I want more of this, more of that? But when you serve the plate and you eat it and the plates taken away, people tend to engage more with each other rather than what's on the table. So it's a, it creates a, you know, it's like eating in a restaurant where you just don't worry about, what's next because someone's taking care of you. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're clever enough to be able to, to pull that off, it it really makes, it elevates people's experience. Well, I'm ready for the next step. Okay, go Chris. Gravy. So this is all leading up to the, uh, the, the big deal of gravy. And gravy just, I know, gravy sounds very diner to me. Um, I'm at the stove now, just so you know, these are my hands, I'm here. Um, but gravy's, you know, it, who cares, gravy, whatever. But I tell you, when you make the gravy right, here's what you hear at the table. People go, that gravy, oh, that gravy. Because what happens is the flavor, not just, they don't feel on the front of their tongue, it, 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 it fills every room of their mouth. And, it's, it's such a wonderful experience to have that mouth experience um, beyond, you know, of course, eating nutritious food. Um, so I, I dedicate this section to my um, sister-in-law, Deborah. She really is the one who taught me uh, how to make good gravy because um, my mom, bless her heart, from the Midwest, always thought her gravy was the cat's meow. Uh, but I realized it was, you know, Midwest cat's meow. And when I figured this out, I was like, oh, my God. So really, the, um, the, the glory of making a good gravy is a roux. And all a roux is is equal parts of a fat and flour that you mix together so they become like Elmer's glue almost. I mean, the consistency, right? And then, um, oh, yeah, and don't remember, and don't forget, you, you are going to get this recipe. So you don't have to really write anything down. Um, but anyway, uh, you, 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 you make the roux and then you start adding the sauce, but what's really amazing about you and your experiences today, the alchemy of adding stock that we took two days to make, actually the stock is not two day stock, but anyway, just so you know, um, taking that stock mixed with that roux, it's magic what happens. Um, so there's oils that you, you, the fats you can use are like basically vegetable oil. You can use butter. Uh, or what I really like to use is, let me get this so you can see it, duck fat. Now, I just buy this in a jar at the store. I, I get it at my local Lucky, so that's my local supermarket. Um, this stuff kills. Um, and so for adventuresome sake, I'm going to do, um, oh, good, still good. Um, I'm going to mix uh, duck fat and butter when I make my roux today, all right? So bear with me because things are going to get crazy when I do this. So I'm going to put in two tablespoons of duck fat. That's about right. And it's already, I don't know if you can see it's starting to smoke, but it's starting to smoke. So yeah, this pan's hot. When I make a roux, I like my pan hot. You can read some recipes where they're like, Put the pan medium low and stir for 45 minutes. No, thank you. Um, so here's butter, right? So we have insanity going on already. So I put in a quarter cup of fat, basically. Um, and now I'm going to add my, and my butter sizzling. I'm going to add my flour. And now I'm going to get busy. And all I'm doing is I'm mixing 
the, the fat with the flour. So when you first put it in, smell it. What you smell, this is really hot. I'm going to turn this down. Um, so this roux is cooking really fast, which is great for the demo. Um, but for you at home, if you, if you get freaked out like, crap, it's, it's getting too hot too fast, just take it off the stove. Don't, don't risk burning your roux because then you can't serve it. So right now I'm actually stir I'm stirring this off the heat and I'm gonna turn my heat way down. It's a good save. Now what happens is, I'm gonna show this to you in the camera, is that, look, look at the color of that. That was white flour just a second ago. And this will be the color of your, your gravy, however dark you want this to become. So I could say, yeah, I want like a medium beige, or I could cook my roux a little bit longer and get it darker. This is where you control the depth of the flavor of the roux, but also um, the depth of the color. So I have next to me stock that's really hot. It's not boiling, but you can see how much it's steaming. So get ready. This is the part that's nuts. This is the alchemy. So I'm going to start with a ladle. And I'm going to pour it in. Holy crap. So now it just starts going nuts. You think, oh, man, what did I just do? I ruined everything. Because everything curdles up. It gets, like, bubbly and hot. And you're thinking, um, I just ruined dinner. But just after my third ladle full, it starts to settle down. It's still bubbling, but it, it's settling down. I'm going to do one more. I like to make my gravy a little bit thinner um, than I'm going to serve it because all gravy will do is thicken before you serve it. So, so when you keep it on a little bit of heat, it's just going to uh, get thicker. So now my, that's it. The alchemy is over. That flash, the first time I did it, just freaked me out. First time I really experienced was when I made gumbo using oil and um, and flour, it just bit. So now it's there. And next you would just season it with salt and pepper, right? Now when I, I'm gonna turn my heat off. It's bubbling a little bit, but I know it's not burning. So I'm, I like a ton of pepper. So just pretend like I did that like five times as long. I like lots of black pepper in my gravy. And then what kind of salt am I gonna use? Yes, kosher salt, that's correct. I'm gonna throw a little kosher salt in there. Is I can control the um, the amount of salt by knowing knowing my salt. Oh, this came out great. So this consistency is really nice. It's a little thinner than I will be serving it because it's going to uh, thicken. Let me show it to you. Look at that. Let me get up there. Look at that gorgeous gravy. Ooh, baby. That looks amazing. I know it's. Uh, I mean, thank you. Um, now. This is the best tip I ever learned. Chopped tarragon, really finely chopped, bang. The contrast of tarragon, I don't know if you know tarragon, but it's kind of like parsley meets um, anise. Uh, it's just, uh, it, it, list, it, it, kind of goes, it pulls the, the flavor in the opposite direction. And when you add it, the little green flecks almost dissolve. And then you get um, a gravy that's got these little green flecks in it. Mm, oh, and the smell of tarragon. I will probably have to properly season this a little bit more after the demo, but I am going to test a little bit now. You know, you, you can see how it coats the back of the spoon beautifully. You know, it's just, that's what you want every time. Hmm, actually, that's perfect. Um, and there you go. Great. Any questions? We do have a question. So uh, I see Carolyn and Ed have another question. I think they're enjoying your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me? Go ahead. You, we can hear you. Yes, go ahead. For you, you raved about duck fat, but you didn't say why. Is there something about the flavor? Is it that much different from the uh, fat that I skim off when I make my broth? I'm just curious as to why, and could you use other animal fats, like perhaps yes. lard or beef tallow, that kind of yes. thing? Yes, yes. Um, just get rendered fat. Um, I, actually, I sent a picture 
to both Alice and Caress when I was shopping for duck fat because we were talking about it before this webinar. And um, there was beef, there was um, duck, and what was the other one? Was it chicken or I, I don't remember, but pork. Um, it was pork. Oh, pork. Interesting. But what's great about these is that they're rendered. And all that means is that they just cook all the bad stuff out of it. It's strained. I mean, the jars aren't cheap. Like a jar of that duck fat maybe is 11 bucks. So it's like, that's some expensive fat. But the texture, the roundness, the smoothness, and the flavor of it, it's not like butter. Know that butter cooks the fastest. So if you want to do a really fast roux, just use butter. I like the mixture of the butter and the fat because I get some of that dairy essence, excuse me, in my um, gravy. But I also get that um, nice round, round flavor of, of the duck fat. Um, it's, it's so worth it. If you've never made duck stock, uh, use a duck stock with the duck fat for a, and make that part of your gravy or another reduction sauce. It's out of this world. Excellent. Thank you. We have another question too from Catherine. Um, so Carolyn and Ed, did you get your question answered? You're good? Yes. Yes, we're good. Thank All you. All right. Good. Uh, so Catherine, if you want to go ahead and uh, unmute yourself, go ahead and ask your question. My question is about using ghee. Uh -huh. Like, can you use it? Yeah, would, would you suggest that as well? You know, it's funny because right next to the three bottles of rendered duck fat at the store was a bottle of ghee on one side and Crisco, the hard white Crisco on the other. <laughs> so, yeah, I think they're pretty replaceable. <laughs> um, and, and ghee is just like a clarifier. it right here. There's your photo. Oh, yeah, Chris, oh, got it. You, see, <laughs> you can see the organic ghee that was on one side. Of <laughs> Isn't that funny? See, I don't know about lying. Um, yeah, I don't see why it wouldn't work. I've never tried it. I'm kind of excited. It's actually that ghee is already salted, it looks like. So just be careful if you're using a ghee that has salt, you know, taste it before you add salt. I just, you know, recklessly threw salt into my um, gravy before I tasted it, um, just because I know it's going to need some. Uh, but yeah, wh why not? I mean, I usually use ghee, of course, in Indian cooking because that's, you know, I think that was its origin that I know of. Have, buffalo. You, oh, buffalo. that ghee is made from buffalo milk. Yeah, or butter, yeah. Oh, what a trip. Nice. Interesting. Oh, I'm glad I know something you didn't know. <laughs> you learn something new every day. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Bison. Yeah. All right, so uh, Caress, is there any other, uh, Chris, anything else? The final thoughts. Do you want me to share final thoughts or do we have time? Quickly, final thoughts. Um, okay, so a couple things that are really most important that we didn't cover at all. One thing is when you're doing a big meal, you, food safety is important. So if, if you don't want food sitting out, either keep it in the fridge or keep it at 140 degrees um, until you're ready to work with it. Uh, that, that's just, just, even after you've cooked it, uh, it'll just keep it safe. And my last tip, it's just for me, don't forget to put the coffee on while you serve the main course. So when dessert comes, for those who want coffee, it's ready. Perfect. Thank you. And thank you so much, Chris, so much fun. Uh, happy holidays to everybody. We